three, two. Well, good morning, people all around the world. All around the world. From Ireland, Scotland, England, Wales, Australia, welcome to Impact Live. Cheryl, why don't you tell us what's going on and some announcements, and then uh, we're going to have another special one for the guys. Good morning. I just want to uh, let you know, Stephen just had a birthday this week on Friday, so happy birthday, Stephen. And Cheryl and Billy, it's their anniversary today, right? Happy anniversary. Woohoo! We got to do the song. I know, but then we can. Okay, go ahead. A happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you, every day of the year. May you feel Jesus near, a happy birthday to you, a happy birthday to you, the best year you've ever had, the best year you've ever had, big, the best year you've ever had. A happy anniversary to you, a happy anniversary to you, may the, has it? Yay. <laughs> so for announcements, Ladies Tea is coming up Saturday, July 18th. That is really soon. So I need you guys to sign up or let me know after church if you guys want to come. If you need a ride, we will be, uh, we'll meet at the church to give rides. So all the details, you can ask me about that. But that will be at events. It's going to be a really great time. So if we end up getting more than 10, then we'll plan uh, for another one. So we got to kind of know soon what you guys want to do, but it's going to be a really awesome time. Uh, Destiny this summer is starting a girls' summer hangouts. What? So, yeah, this Friday is going to be the first one. It's going to be a, a, a campfire at Peter and Bobby Joe's at 8 o'clock. And she was supposed to make it today. She wasn't feeling well. And then last week she goes, okay, I'm feeling better. And we forgot to leave her a key to get here. <laughs> but anyway, so she just wanted me to let you guys know she just really has a heart for, for young women. And she just wants to have just real conversations, real fun. It will be just a, a great time. So we would like to call Dave up. He was going to give us a quick Ladies announcement. And Morning, everybody. Well, we're thinking it's time again for another men's gathering. So what we're going to be doing, keep your calendars over, it's open. It's kind of a save the date thing. A little bit of a heads up. August 16th, I'm going to be hosting a men's uh, potluck barbecue at my place at 4 p.m. So we're going to come out, do what guys do, love to eat, and have a good time together. But if you like to, ha to fish, you want to get out on the lake. I live on a lake, so you can bring your swim trunks, uh, bring your fishing gear. If you like to fish, come early. Say, say it. 2 o'clock, uh, we'll go out, we'll head out in the boats, we'll do, do a little bit of fishing, make it a mini derby, whatever we want to do. I've got a canoe and I've got a double kayak. If you got, happen to have an extra boat, you want to bring it along, that's fine. You can do that too. That we can give, get everybody out there. But anyway, so save the date for August 16th. We'll ha have a men's time together. Awesome. That's great news. Good news. And I got a kayak and a jar of Vaseline. To get into the hole. <laughs> That's the only way you get in those things for fat people. I mean, just <laughs> pfft, way you get in there. Use the paddles, too. Yeah. <laughs> like a shoehorn. <laughs> like a shoehorn. This is going nowhere fast. Let's all stand. Come on. <laughs> No 
your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky, descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, oh Lord, unveil our eyes, you're the reason we're here, you're the reason we're singing, Open flowing from your heart and feeling every part of our praise open up oh, and open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates a mighty river flowing from your heart and feeling every part of our praise Show us, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show Show us your glory, Lord. Come on, sing that again with me. Lord, show us your glory. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. And open up the heavens. We want to see you open. The flag, it's a mighty river coming from your heart and feeling every part of our praise. And open up the heavens, we want to see you open up the flag, it's a mighty river flowing from your heart and feeling every part of our praise. Oh 
sing it again. Come on. And I will. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yeah. In all my life, you have been faithful. i 
darkest night you were close like no other and known you as a father yeah. and known you as a friend oh i have lived yeah, in the goodness faithfulness. Amen. All my life, all my life, you have been so faithful. All my life, Lord, all my life, you have been so, so good with every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness. so faithful. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. You are so good. We declare your goodness this morning. Oh, you're so, so good. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. goodness of God, I will sing of the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord. Oh, you're so good, you're so good, Father. We love you, Lord, you're so declare his goodness this morning. Amen. In the midst of fire, in the midst of rain, whatever you're going through, he is good. And we can live in that place of his goodness. We can live in that place, God, that you are good no matter what we're going through. Lord, you are good. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, you're good, oh. is running after, running after me, yes it is, your goodness is running after, running after me, with my life laid down, I surrender now, and give you everything, your goodness is running after, running after me, as I 
Isn't that amazing? His goodness is running after me. He's running after you. You can't outrun his goodness. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Oh, we love your goodness, Father. We love you, Lord. Oh, we love you, Lord. Your goodness is running after me, oh God. Oh, your goodness is running after me. It's running after me. Jesus, your goodness is running after us. Oh, thank you, Lord. I mean, oh, it's amazing to be spoiled rotten. I love being spoiled rotten. I do too. I got a gift today, which makes me more spoiled rotten. I'm getting gifts every week. God, thank you, even last week for potato salad. Oh, that made me so fat. Oh, Jesus, but it was so awesome to be highly favored and fat in your flavor. It was awesome. Jesus. You know, we just give God thanks in everything. Everything. It doesn't matter what we're going through. Those of you who are online and you're watching, you know, whatever stuff that we're going through. And some of the stuff that we're going through actually smells really bad too. And you can use whatever definition and whatever description that you want to use for that. But sometimes we just go through stuff. You know, if you want to camp in your stuff, then knock yourself out. Though I walk through the valley of stuff. I fear no evil. It's exciting. I don't know about you, but you know we can always look at a circumstance and go, "Oh, yuck! Poor me! Woe me!" You know, but you are highly favored and blessed of the Lord. Period. There's nothing that you can do that can that that could change God's love for you. Nothing. You can even be disobedient and run away from the will of God, and God's love will still run after you. He his. Some, somebody didn't grasp that because you're sitting with your arms folded going, you know, whatever. But the point is that wherever we are and whatever we do and whatever stuff that we're going through, it's not that Jesus isn't aware of what we're going through. He's perfectly aware of the good times. He's perfectly aware of the sad times. He's perfectly aware of the bad times. He's perfectly aware of the times when you're going, how come, why, and why did this happen to me? For such a time as this, I don't know. But, you know, we get times throughout the week that we're like, oh, man, or in the daytime, oh, man, or why did this happen, or why did this happen, or why did this sale not go through? That crazy person, they don't have no sense. And you're like, whatever. I've learned this week, and I've been learning to choose my battles and choose my arguments and to choose what I want to comment against. And it's amazing. I had some situations even happen at work, and I went to my sales manager, and I said, you know what? It's water under the bridge. I can't change it. I'm not going to let it affect me. It's just off my shoulders, and it's not my problem. It's their problem. They don't want to drive a Honda. No, I just said, you know, hey, I can't change that situation. And they were blown away. The other thing that they were blown away is, is this, and, and it's not to toot anybody's horn, but they were blown away at honesty. How many of people are blown away when you're honest? Because in a, in a, in a day and age where we're so used to having an edge or, or manipulating or doing whatever. You know, last month they, they, they had this meeting that we're going to have tomorrow. And, you know, they, they do all the forecasting and all the salespeople. And, and they're like, you know, we want everybody to do 100. They want 100 cars to be sold in a month. We did 89 last month. And they're like, you know, we want each salesperson to do 20 cars. Now, there's a couple of salespeople that that's, they can do that in their sleep. And so I looked at the situation. I assessed it. And I said, 15. And all the other salespeople looked at me like I just lost my brains. And, and, it'd be, and my sales manager, he, it, it was so awesome to see his countenance on his face. And he's like, 15? I said, yep, I think I can do 15. Well, it come two days ago, the assistant sales manager came up and we were talking afterwards. And he said, you know, what you, what you said in the sales meeting kind of knocked all the management for a loop. He said, they've never had a salesperson be honest because they're always used to well, I, there's a phrase that they use, but I can't say it in church, blowing smoke. And um, <clears throat> so he said uh, they, they've never had a salesperson just be absolutely honest and say, hey, I can do 15. Well, I did 15. And it, they were just like, wow, that's really kind of crazy. And, 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 uh, and yesterday I was thinking about that. And I said, an honest car salesman, is there such a thing? <laughs> I, 
I wrote on my, I wrote on my little sheet, I said, it's hard to pastor and be a car salesman. But the point, <laughs> it's Chad, you know, Chad's over there all the time. And so it is interesting to see what's going on. So I got an email today or this week from Joyce Meyer. And um, I don't know if this is appropriate, but we're going to find out. Um, and just blame it on Joyce. And so I, I got this email. I thought it was really kind of cool. And she was talking about all the different stores that were being looted and, des- and destroyed in New York City. And um, she found out that there's a, there's a, a new store in New York City. I never ran this by you, so she's like, oh my God, what's going to happen? And we are being recorded, and so this is nice being a pastor. No, it's not. So he said, there's a new store in New York City called the Husband Store. It's true. It's a Husband Store in New York City, and there's six floors on this store. And there's some guidelines. The owner of the husband store had some guidelines. And the guidelines were that once you visit a floor and go to the next floor, you can't go back. And you can't look on each floor and then decide what you want on the husband floor. And and Glenn's taking notes. So on the first floor, the sign said, these men have jobs. And the woman was like, wow, a guy with a job. That's absolutely amazing. And she thought, well, if there's a guy with a job, what's the second floor going to look like? So she gets in the elevator, ding, ding, goes up to the second floor, and that sign said, these men have jobs and love kids. And she's like, wow, a guy who loves and has a job? And actually loves kids. That's, that's stellar. That's amazing. But, you know, in her curiosities, she's thinking, there's got to be more. So she goes up to the third floor, and this sign said, these men have jobs, love kids, and are extremely good looking. She's like, oh, I have hit the jackpot. Not only do I have uh, th- this floor have guys who have jobs, but they love kids. They're good looking. They're not overweight. They're just perfect. And she's thinking, there's got to be more, Ryan. So she goes up to the fourth floor. Ding, 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 ding. This sign said, these men have jobs, love kids, are extremely good looking, and help with housework. And you know that's absolutely rare. What are you laughing at? I do housework. I do work around. And I'm at the altar so I can read. I do yard work. Well, yard work is different from housework because yard work is guy work. Housework, we want to split the responsibilities. So she goes to the fifth floor. And the fifth floor sign said, these men have jobs, love kids, are good looking. They, lo- they do housework. And they have a strong romantic streak. She's thinking, and I had to use, I had to rephrase this because... Joyce would have said it a different way. And so she's thinking, wow, I've really, really hit the jackpot. I don't think that I can get any better than, you know, a guy who has a job and kids, good looking, does housework and has a a strong romantic streak. And what? (laughs) Allison's like, hmm, even possible. So just like any other woman, she goes to the sixth floor. And on the sixth floor, there's this sign says, congratulations, your visitor, 37,444,332 to this floor. There are no men on this floor. (laughs) This floor only exists as proof that women are impossible to please. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there and just uh, see what, you know. But send the email to Joyce Meyer at JoyceMeyer.com. And I, there's a second part of this, but I'll save that for another time. And uh, so it is, really, it is really, really cool. You can frame this, you know, for, the, for Father's Day or something, you know, memorable. Or just don't rip it up because it's, it's on your computer. And uh, <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit today about Joshua. And, you know, we all have favorite uh, uh, chapters in the Bible. We always have, you know, different heroes of the faith. Daryl's loving that story back there. Susie's going, I'll kill you. 
Well, the second part of it is, the second phase is, I'll send you the thing in the email just because there's a couple children here and it may, it may not go well with mom and dad. So I'll send you the second phase of that, which is even really funnier. So Joshua, let's get back on track because the women are just going to kill me. <laughs> no more chips from Bobby, no more Cheetos for Bobby, no more Coke for Pastor Bobby, no more... Where was that thing? I didn't mean any of this. This was just, you know, it's all, it's, it, was just, it was just something that should never have been said. And Joyce is bad Joyce Meyer, bad Joyce Meyer. So I have struggled with this thing all week long because there's a, there's a part of this that I really, really dig, but I couldn't come up with a title. And you know I love my titles, but I couldn't come up with a title. But we'll see if we can come up with one as we get in with this thing. So I want you to go to Joshua. If you own a thing called a Bible, then it's, it's like one typically a black, could be burgundy, could be blue. It has a bunch of pages on it. And I'm not putting them on the overhead anymore because I want people to actually you know bring these things. They're... There are, for those of you who are, you know, over, overheads, overhead people. But Joshua, but I actually printed out on mine just, you know, so. But I found something today that I have never seen before. And so I love this whole story about Joshua, but I went back to Deuteronomy because we know the story then when Moses went up to the mountain and, and he passed on the baton. And I saw something in here that I knew that Jesus, I knew that God really loved Moses. I knew that he had a great relationship with him. But this was interesting because he brings them up to this mountain. And it really has nothing to do with this, but I just thought it was kind of interesting. He brings them up to the mountain and he says, I've caused you to see, uh, you know, with your own eyes, you know, the promised land that you'll never really go into. But he says, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. Now, Glenn, you probably have seen this because you're the theologian of the camp. He says, so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab. And I thought, well, who's he? And after all these years of studying the word, for some crazy reason, that just, it skipped over, that sent this, I thought, who was he? It was God, that God buried Moses in the mountain. And it said that they don't even know where the grave is. And I thought that that was interesting because he had such a relationship. I don't know of anybody else who have had such a relationship that God actually took time to go bury him. And I thought that that intimacy was absolutely amazing. And so Moses comes along, and Moses is, is having this, the, the end of his journey, if you will. And in Joshua chapter 1, it said, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun. Now that's a very important phrase, because it proves that Joshua had no parents. It sounded funnier when I was thinking about it earlier, but I, apparently it's not, unless they're slow. But he said, Joshua, son of Nun, it wasn't N-O-N-E, but it was son of, you know, N-U-N, which would be even more of a miracle if he was son of uh, a nun. <laughs> but anyway, he said, so after the death of Moses, servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses, Abe, my, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people... All these people that he inherited because Joshua was the successor of Moses as Israel's leader. And Moses symbolized the law, seeing that he was one who brought the law to the people. And that the law could not lead the people to victory or bring the peace of the promised land. So the law, which was symbolic of Moses, could not and does not bring victory over any enemy. However, it says that a Savior had to come and do what the law could not. Joshua was that successor, and he led the people into the promised land. And Cheryl actually found this earlier, that the word Joshua, his name means salvation, that the name Joshua literally means Jehovah is his help or Jehovah the Savior. Now, we're not saying that Joshua was Jesus, but Joshua was a picture. And it was interesting to see what all is going on here because he tells them, get ready to do something. He said, I want you to get ready. I want you to cross the land, cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give you to the Israelites. He said, I will give you every place. Now, we've all heard this story before. 
But he said, I'm going to give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses, that your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, and the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. So I'm thinking right now that maybe we should entitle this, It's Time to Go. It's time to go. So I'm thinking about just these four verses right here. He says, get ready. How many of you can't, you can't cross anything until you get ready to do it? In other words, he says, I want you to prepare yourself. You can't go evangelize until you're ready to go do it. You can't go on a journey. We can't go fishing. We can't go kayaking until we, how many of it's very difficult to go kayaking without a kayak? I mean, that would be kind of weird, right? And so he says, get your supplies ready. Get ready to cross the Jordan River. So the Jordan River is any obstacle, any barrier that can prevent you from getting to the promised land. So the Jordan River was that one little barrier right there. And I don't know about you, but I've heard a phrase uh, a few years back, and it actually said, never stick your toe in the water to test the waters, but stick your toe in the water to make waves. That when God has given us a, a mandate of, of territory to occupy and to take, it is never, and it's never been a, a suggestion. Go do it if you really want to. Because he had a purpose behind the plan. He says, I want you to prepare, I want you to cross, and I want you to occupy until I come. And how many know that the mandate of the promised land is really no different now as it was back then? That we prepare to go, and you never know what you're going to come, come in contact with. And we're going to get into that a little bit later on when we find out exactly what these guys had to go up against. So if you're writing notes or you're taking notes, here's the first point. Because this whole story revolves around one word, and it's courage, or being courageous. And he says in number one, courage rests upon a clear assignment. Courage rests upon a clear assignment. The assignment was there, and the mission was clear. The mission was simple. Get ready. Get ready to do what? Get ready to cross. Get ready to cross what? The Jordan. Why am I going to cross the Jordan? Because I'm going to go into the promised land. It would be as if I said today, get ready, get your stuff together, Get rid of all your fear, all your panicking, all your worrying, all your stuff, all your junk. We're going to cross the LaHave River somehow. We're going to cross the river, and we're going to go to the other side. If that were the promised land, if that were the promised land, I would never be content living in Oak Hill. If I knew that was the promised land. Now, if that was Destin, Florida, that would really be the promised land. But the point of it is this, that LaHave River as not quite so drinkable, if that were not there, would we still go over and take possession of the land? If that area of town over there, if God said, this is your land, would we be content staying here and relinquishing what God had promised and giving that to somebody else? No. If God specifically said, I am going to be with you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you along the way. I'm going to pave the way. We would be absolutely out of our brains if we sat here praying for direction when God specifically gave you direction to go ahead and do it. Yet how many in the body of Christ are, have that mentality that God says, I've given you a land, I've, I've given you an opportunity, I've given you a promise to go into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, yet we still stay here and praying for an angelic visitation. Or some kind of supernatural. How I many know we sometimes sometimes we want everything but the word of God? We want a manifestation of it, but we don't necessarily want the word. Does that make sense? Or am I just like out to lunch? Because I've been thinking about this stuff this week and it's been bugging me. That there's no such thing as courage apart from a mission. And just as there's no such thing as faith apart from a challenge, that you're courageous to conquer a challenge. God is giving Joshua, he tells them three times, and it's not like he had a speech impediment. He tells them three times, and we'll get to it. He says, I want you to be courageous. I want you to be very courageous, which gives me the indication that he wasn't courageous 
Even though in Deuteronomy 33 and whatever it is, the last, yeah, Deuteronomy 33, whatever verse, he says that Moses laid his hands on Joshua and imparted wisdom. Because anybody like Joshua, who's about to inherit up to 600,000 people, and then take on the mantle and the baton of Moses being God's favorite, pretty much. I mean, that is a massive responsibility. And you would need wisdom to inherit all these people. Joshua just received this baton from, from Moses. And now he's leading, leading the descendants of the people who first received the promise to the promised land. And as for Moses, a man of God had died. But listen to this. Even though the man of God had died, nothing of God died. The same mission needed to be accomplished. And I'm thinking about all this stuff. That God is not worthy of men and women. He makes you worthy. So we don't need to fear the loss of any of his human instruments. We honor the fallen soldiers. And God is not fearful of man's failures either because there will always be somebody ready to step up. A lot of us may be absolutely, totally wired differently. You are very much wired differently than I am. And thank God for that, that you're not wired the way that I am. You couldn't function. You can't function as me. I can't function as you, but you function good as you. I function good as me. And together can function junction at you. It's exciting for me that your courage, write this down if you can, your courage will rise when, you're, when you have confidence in the call. Your courage will rise when you have confidence in the call. God can call you to do whatever, but if your courage, isn't, if your courage and your confidence isn't matching the call, it doesn't matter what's going to happen because in your brain you're going to think that you're a coward. God wants to instill you and impart inside of each and every one of us courage. And most people leave ministry not because of a lack of compassion, but lack of confidence. And if ever there was a time, I've, I've had this phrase in my brain for years, and it's this, that radical Christianity is normal Christianity. Anything less than that is subnormal. Glenn actually likes that. I can look at the corner of my eye and see if he's writing it down. <laughs> radical Christianity is normal Christianity. Anything less than that is subnormal, subpar. And then we fall short of God's actual desire and call for each and every one of us. There are some people who are called to pray, and that's awesome. I used to be, I used to be kind of weirded out because we would do Mardi Gras outreach, and we would do all these crazy outreaches and all this, and I've heard people go, well, I'll just sit back and pray, and I'm like, oh, you weenie, you need to come out and come with the soldiers. But then I thought, you know, how many times have I gone in the battle without prayer support? And then I was grateful for the people who may not have that bold, tenacious, bold, you know, kind of calling on their life, but maybe they're a little subdued in some areas, but they're going to sit back and, and pray, and pray for angelic visitations, pray for openings, pray for whatever it is. The cool thing about it is that as a body of believers, we all have different parts of this body that are, that are functioning. I just wish this part wouldn't function quite so much. This is like, what's up with this? Thank you, Laura. Larry Randolph said, Laura, give me a present. Give me that, put those, tape that back together again. Larry Randolph said, God fulfills all his promises. Listen to this. God fulfills all his promises, but he is not obligated to fulfill all potential. God fulfills all his promises, but is not obligated to fill our potential. Sometimes the Lord gives us a promise that carries with it an invitation to a potential or a possibility or to a realm of conquest or dominion. That he has a promise for all of us. But every one of us has a potential that we need to lock the potential with the promise in order for it to become a possibility. And if it doesn't become a possibility, then one of these, things, one of these two things are out of whack. 
And I wonder, it's just sometimes all this week, I just, you know, bombard my brain going, you know, what's it going to take? Because here's the biggest revelation, Glenn, Peggy. Bridgewater's not that stinking big. Matter of fact, what's the size of Oak Hill for crying out loud? We all say we want to conquer the nations. But yet, I wonder how many of us have actually spoken to too many any, anybody in Oak Hill. See, you can't have the you can't have the nations if you don't have the neighborhood. <laughs> and I'm not chewing on anybody. I'm just making a generic statement that we can't have the nations if we can't have the neighborhood. We can't have the population if we can't have a person. And the only reason, the only way we're going to grab a population is if we do it one person at a time. The only that way that we're going to grab a nation is if we grab a neighborhood. Because in the confines of a neighborhood, there are representations of nations. And you might have somebody who's from India in your neighborhood or somebody from Poland in your neighborhood. And you never really know that if you reach out to the person from India or you reach out for the person from Poland or you reach out for the person from Czechoslovakia or whatever it is, then that one person can potentially reach nations. And when they reach nations, guess, you get some reward for that. You get some credit for that. Because if you have not reached that person, that person may not have gone to the nations. And we get to this place in our purpose in our lives where we're like, well, I don't know and I'm, fear, and I'm fearful and quite often we let the fear dominate our faith. Instead of having the faith dominate our fears. And so God takes, us, t- takes Joshua on this journey. And the promised land in the Old Testament was a type of the kingdom of God in the New Testament. And it, this part gets really, really exciting to me because I'm thinking again on the title of the message, it's time to go, it's not time to sit. Back when we were doing ministry, we would always say, get off your seat and get in the street. <laughs> and we would begin to show and demonstrate. We love doing that. We just like demonstrate and demonstrate the love of God. And I, I heard something even this week. It was just so awesome. If, if you watched the video that Cheryl posted, and some of you saw the, the, the chop neighborhood, you know, the thing in Seattle where, the, where the, the group of people went in there and took the seven or seven blocks and took the, uh, what do you call the police precinct and all this thing. And, you know, they wanted to have their own nation and all this kind of craziness going on. And all of a sudden, Charlie Champ, I think, right? Charlie and, and a group of other people. Um, and this was interesting because they had a street preacher that went in there and started blasting them. And they, that didn't get anywhere. I mean, you know, sometimes you just, you just had, there's a phrase, kill him with kindness. And Charlie went in there, and his group of people went in there. They didn't go in there with a cross. They didn't go in there with big signs, turn or burn. (laughs) They didn't go in there, but they went in there with a great big heart with human feet on. And they started loving on people and ministering to people and and listening to, to, to whatever was going on. And people were getting saved. People were getting healed. People were getting delivered. And it was awesome because it wasn't too far after that. Then, then the mayor went in there and, and started cleaning up the place. But they were able to reach them, not with signs and placards and protesting, but they reached them with the grace and the love of God. And see, that was their territory. God says, you know what? This was territory that was taken away from me. Now I want you to go in and, and, and be a representation of heaven And when you're a representation of heaven, then glory is going to come. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we want to see Bridgewater or Oak Hill or whatever place that you represent be a representation of the kingdom of God, then we have to go in with something other than a track. Because I haven't seen too many bumper stickers lead people to Jesus. I haven't seen too many signs... There may be signs of the times, but it's not those signs. I have a friend, dear friend, I won't tell him his name because he probably will, but I have a friend down south, and he has a little megaphone, and he's on the corner and preaching on a corner. And I'm like, what is this doing? Cars are driving by all the time. They're not paying any attention. I did that one time. We, were, we had a, a, a big mouse costume. It was an eight-foot, seven-foot Winston the church mouse. I was in it, actually, as Winston. Hi, everybody. We're going to have a great time. And I w- we were in Dallas, Texas, and on the corner, 
Yes. So I was there waving at everybody. Hi, everybody. And we were having this thing with the Salvation Army, a kids program. Hi, everybody. All of us on here. And the person was watching the mouse and not watching where they were going. Boop. And about that time, God said, God's not giving me a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Sound mind said, let's go. So we kind of went back. So we're talking about possessing the land. Faith qualifies you to receive your inheritance. Write that down if you can think about it. That faith qualifies you to receive your inheritance. So Joshua 1 through 4, when we talks about this whole thing about the Old Testament promise. So when we talk about the Old Testament promised land in the natural, it's a picture of the New Testament kingdom of God. So this is an invitation to a realm in God that you inherit. That the Old Testament abundance was a land. It was like a physical realm. And the New Testament form is abundance in the supernatural spirit realm. So in other words, it's the realm of the king's dominion that we step into. So here's the second point. Courage rests upon the assurance of God's presence. Courage rests upon the assurance of God's presence. Now, Verse 5 through 10 in Joshua chapter 1. This is so, so good. I love this whole stuff. He says, nobody. So he's already told them, you know, we're going to go in, prepare, cross the Jordan, take possession of the land, all that. He says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. What you going to do, brother? No one will be able to stand against you all the days. I did that at the dealership yesterday, and the salespeople, they were cracking up. They're like, you really lost your brain. I said, yeah, I haven't been able to find it for years. But he said, what's all this Hulk Hogan stuff? No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, what a promise this is. If you guys can grasp this, that the promise that was for Moses and the promise that was for Joshua is not only for Joshua and it's all of his kids, then it tells you that you are still part of that lineage. That the promise is for a legacy. He says, as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. I will not leave you alone. I'll not leave you an orphan. I'll not leave you abandoned. He says, be strong and courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. And I know for some of us, we may, be, we may not be connecting with this scripture because it's a nice, cute story that happened a long time ago. But how many know the stories that happened a long time ago, if you adopt them in the present, it'll change the future. His calling, Joshua's calling, was a statement of God's presence. What would you do if you knew that God's presence would accompany you everywhere you go? What would you do? Where would you go? What would you say? If you knew that God's presence would accompany you. The good news is God's presence is accompanying you. Why are we not doing the opposite? He says, verse 7, be strong and very courageous. So not only are you strong and courageous, but he says, I want you to be strong and very courageous. And then here's the key. He says, be careful to obey all the law that my servant Moses gave you. In other words, the law was the Old Testament, but we bring it into the New Testament. You can say it this way. Be careful to obey the word. Be careful to obey all the law or my word my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. That you may be successful wherever you go. I love, there's a quote that I have here from Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson says, never make the mistake of confusing spiritual maturity with income and possessions. And he said, neither do we want to equate spiritual maturity with poverty. He says, if you want to be successful, not in this world's terminology, if you want to be successful in heaven's economy, he says, you're, you're going to keep the book of the law Always on your lips, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and then you'll be successful. 
So what's the key for success and prosperity? It's not in the numbers. Surprisingly, it's not in the numbers that's in your bank account, although that's how we equate success, by all the toys and material things that we have. But he says, if you meditate on the word of the Lord, matter of fact, I read somewhere that if you actually um, studied uh, the book of Proverbs, if you read the book of Proverbs for a year regularly, then you would have the, uh, the keys to be financially successful. If you adopted the book of Proverbs year after year for five years, not only would you have, adop- not only would you have read the keys for success, but, do you, and, but through that five years, that because you meditated on it and you applied it, then you could actually potentially be a millionaire just through, and that's <laughs> relative, but you would still have the keys to be successful But the point is, as you're meditating on the word of the Lord, half of us meditate on junk that we have no business meditating on, and we wonder why we have a poverty mindset. And a poverty mindset is not a financial mindset. Poverty mindset is a mindset that that you're enslaved, that you're in captivity to something other than the word. Oh, I don't know. This sounds a whole lot better when I'm getting it ready. But he says, verse 10, So Joshua ordered the, the officers of the people... He said, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Because three days from now, you're going to cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of land that the Lord your God is going to give you. I love this part of the story. Because quite often, we want to take the part where it says, get your supplies ready, we're going to go in. As if it's going to happen right now. But here he said, get your supplies ready because three days from now. It took them three days to get their stuff together. Which tells me also that just because you get a prophetic word from somebody doesn't mean that you have to activate on it right now. Bill Johnson has a whole file, Peggy, of of prophetic words that people have given him. And he looks over every one of those words and there's a time for each one of those words. And it may not happen right away because sometimes we're not ready to receive the word right now. But he says, three days from now, we're going to go in and we're going to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is going to give you. And Phillips Brooks says, don't ask for a task equal to your powers. Ask for powers equal to your task. That you're going to need the ability. You're going to need maybe some kind of training, maybe some kind of school of supernatural ministry. You're going to need something to prepare us and, 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 and de-brainwash us. Or maybe we should just forget the D and just say brainwash. In other words, we need someone to wash our brains of the fear, the doubt, and the unbelief of I can't. And get us to the place where we say, I can do. Joyce Meyer says we need to fill our life with can do, not mountain do. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And Bill Johnson, I was thinking about this this week, and I was reading some articles, and he said that success and prosperity are biblical. Because in verse 8, he says, then you'll make your way prosperous. And he he underlined these two words when he said, then you will make your way prosperous. He says, the Lord does not do it for you. He gives you the tools, but it's up to us to use the tools. So that's what I said, you know, when you look at even Proverbs. Proverbs. And there's tools in there that if you apply them and if you use them, then you'll find that, 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 that we live a life that goes beyond just breathing air. I mean, I don't know about you, but I shared this the last few weeks, and, and God's been dealing with this in my brain that I'm going to be 60 in a couple months, and I'm thinking, well, I got, you know, if I get 40 years, I get another generation out of this, if I get to be 100, what am I going to do in this latter half of my life? Forget this retirement nonsense. That I know that I might be retired, but for me, I'll be refired. I, just, I just want to keep, I'd rather wear out than rust out, man. I don't want to just retire and just, you know, sit back and watch TV all day or watch the waves come in. Oh, that would drive me nuts. But I'm wired that way. You might be wired for retired. It actually rhymed, didn't it? But you may be wired for retired, but I'm not. But I'm hoping that maybe after the next few weeks or a few months that you're going to be wired to be refired. I want to rewire some of you so you're fired up, fueled up, and ready to take this itty-bitty town called Bridgewater hostage for Jesus Christ. At least that's what I'm thinking. So he says, this is interesting because it's always been God's desire to bless you, and it may not be yours, but it's his. It may not be your desire to be blessed, but it's his desire 
to bless you. And I thought about this this week when I wrote down that I am responsible for my own prosperity and I'm responsible for my own success. Me. You do what y'all want. But here he says, then you will make your way prosperous if I meditate on the, if I don't let the word of the law depart from my mouth, if I meditate, it, meditate on it day and night. And so preparation, preparation prepares the way. Listen to this. This is so good. That preparation prepares the way. Fear prepares you to stay. How many of us, without raising your hand, that we have, we have, we have membership in the club of fear? And that we're not preparing to occupy, we're just preparing to breathe. He says preparation prepares the way, fear prepares you to stay. How long? Well, ask the children of Israel what happened to them. Forty years. Forty years. So that leads me to the third point. Courage rests upon a focused determination. Focus, determination. Somebody said, you know you're flying over the right target when you're being shot at. <laughs> when you're getting opposition of some sort, yay, that's awesome. When people are in your grill, if people agree with you all the time, something's wrong. I'm not saying go out there and be confrontational. But you can be confrontive, but not confrontational. And it sounds like, the, it sounds like it's the two same words, but it's not that way. Just because you disagree with somebody doesn't necessarily mean that you're argumentative. Because we all, especially nowadays in the last six months, everybody has an opinion. Right or wrong, everybody has an opinion. When somebody comes to you at work or whatever, and whatever it is that they do is contrary to your convictions, it's not the Christian way just to go, oh, it's okay, brother. Peace. And I told you before, when people come up at work and they use God's name in vain, I'm like, no, stop talking about my dad, please. And they're like, what? And then you have a nice, awesome way to confront them in a way that's not going to be confrontational, but it'll at least get them to think. How many know sometimes, and I said this earlier, and Glenn brought it up in a Bible study a while back, that it's not my job to get people saved, it's my job to get them to make a decision. Because decisions determine the direction of your destiny. And Joshua was in this situation right now. He could have heard, and he heard the word of the Lord. He, how many know, he could have bypassed the call. He could have said, you know what? Uh, nah, I'm retired. Moses was 120 years when he di- old when he died. Joshua wasn't that far behind. And here he is taking in this responsibility. And he could have said, no, give it to the young bucks. But he realized if I accept the call and, I, and I, I have the courage to accept the call and I have the confidence to accept the call that I know that I'm never going to be called a coward because I took the call and I'm going to go out with confidence knowing that there's a land that God said I can have if I just go and do it. It's super duper awesome and one person agrees. So here as we wrap this up, this is what happens. This is the problem. And I'll see if I can go through this, but I just want to read it. So in Numbers, what good can come out of Numbers? Well, more Numbers. Numbers 13, he says, The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send out one of his leaders. So the Lord commands Moses, and he sent them out to the desert of Paran, and all of them were leaders, and along in the story, he sends out these spies, they're, they're leaders from every tribe, and he goes out, and, and Moses gives them, gives them these questions, what kind of land do they live in, is it good or bad, what kind of towns do they live in, are they unwalled, are they fortified, how's the soil, is it fertile, poor, are there trees, are there grapes, are, are all this stuff. And these guys come back, and they're freaking out, and they're, 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 they're looking, and they're saying, Moses, yeah, it's awesome. We brought back a cluster of grapes. It shows that the promised land is, is legit. It's true. It's, it's everything that, that Yahweh said it would be. And they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community, and, and, they, and they reported to them, uh, to the whole assembly, about the fruit of the land. And then they said, they gave, they, they said we went into the land in which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey, and there is fruit. Here is it. But 
The people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified, and they're very large, and we're scared, and I know God said it, but I don't believe it, and it doesn't settle it for me. The Amalekites are there, and they're big, and the Jebusites are there, and the Amorites are there, and the mosquito bites are there, and the cellulites are there, and the afraid of heights are there, and the traffic lights are there, and all the lights are there, and they're so huge. <laughs> and then Caleb pipes up. Thank God for somebody who wants to shut these whiners up. Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land. Aye, if he was Scottish. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than us. And they spread among the Israelites a, a bad report about the land that they had explored. And they're all freaking out. And he said, well, you know, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And, 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 and you know, we looked at them and we just felt insignificant and we felt really small. God was not happy with that at all. So what does God do? For every 40 days that they were out there spying the land, he puts them in this private little prison for another 40 years. Every day represented a year. And he said, you know what? Because of your disobedience, because of your lack of faith, you're not going to go in and take possession of the land that I offered to you for free. He said, I didn't go in, I didn't, I didn't give you something so you can come back and whine about the obstacles. He said, I've given you the land. And if I've given you the land, I'm going to give you the resources to take the land. But they never looked at the resources. They always looked at the obstacles. And I'm thinking about all this stuff here today. That their perception of the enemy was greater than their perception of themselves and their God. And because of their unbelief, they disqualified themselves for the very thing that God said that they can have. And that there's an element of faith that must be apprehended. There's an element of faith that must apprehend the promise in order for it to become a reality. It's our responsibility to run with perseverance, listen to this, and hold hostage the promise until it becomes a reality. God's given you so many promises, even personal things. And because life hands you a bowl of pits, and you're like, oh, you want to focus on the pits and not the cherries. You want to focus on the problem and not the solution. The cool thing is, as a spirit-filled believer, you're a problem solver. You're a problem solver. And it's interesting because he says, oh, you're going to be bold and you're going to be courageous. And the last thing is this. He says, courage is anchored by the word of God. It's anchored by the word. That success or failure in a mission is tied, listen to this, is tied to your relationship to the truth. Not necessarily to the truth in a word form, but the truth. Because the truth will set you free. Not just the word of truth, but the author of truth, Jesus. The truth will set you free. So my question then is this as we wrap this up. If the truth will set you free, and if you're bound to the word... Can you become the word? Think about that. Let that sink in for a little bit. Can you be the word? In other words, as you meditate on the word, the word becomes cellular. It's interwoven in the fabric of your being down to the bone marrow. It's a lifetime engagement with the words that came directly out of the, out of the mouth of the Lord itself. Where he said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That people can't live their life based on stories and illustrations. That God wants us to proclaim the word not just to the public, but he wants you to proclaim the word privately. Don't let it depart from your mouth. That the word is the background noise of your life. Think about it. The word is the background noise to your life that I thrive. I thrive because he's alive. I thrive because he's alive. And if you want to see what the Father saw, you need to start saying what he said. 
you want to see what the Father saw, you need to start saying what he said. You need to speak it so that your ears can hear it. What does the word say? I love Peggy because you're so adamant on the word. What does the word say? What does it say for you? What does it say to you? What does it say with you? That you're going to go in and take possession of the land. Period. I like it. I can hear her. Period. <laughs> you need to say it so you connect with what he said. Say the word so that you connect with what he said. So that you're not living your life based on your own opinions. Because if you did, then you'll have more comments on Facebook and who cares. So what's the definition of meditation? To reflect, to moan, to ponder, to mutter, to, to make a quiet sign, to contemplate. The Hebrew means to meditate on the scriptures. And I, I want you to write this down if you can. That and, 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 and See if this makes any sense, because it, it made sense to me, but again, I'm wired differently. That whoever captures your mind captures the land. Whoever, whatever, captures your mind captures the land. If the word cannot capture your mind, you can't possess the land. Moses and jo or Joshua, remember? He said, go in, you're going to take possession of the land. Don't let the book of the law depart from your mouth. You're going to be successful, whatever you do. If, you, if, you're word, it, if you're not meritating and meditating on the word and becoming the word, you'll never take possession of the land. You'll never even take possession of yourself. We'll never take possession of ourselves if we can't let the word fill us and dominate us. Taking dominion of your mind is more important. Listen, taking dominion of your mind is more important than taking dominion of the nation because whoever captures your thought life controls your will, your emotions, and your ability to comprehend if it's God or the devil talking to you. That's why sometimes we need a brain surgery, brainwashing, right, girls? You know, we just need God just to do something on the inside because there's so, there's so much information coming in in this information realm that we get so confused, and you got everybody blabbing all over the blah 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 blah, blah, blah. and you're like, oh my God, shut up! Part of me, there's a part of me. I don't know how this is going to come across, but sometimes I wish that every so-called prophet would just be silent. And we just get back to what he said. And I'm not, hear my heart when I say this, I'm not, I'm not belittling the gift. But there's so much blah, blah, blah that we don't even listen to this anymore. Because for whatever re reason, we're so spiritually lazy to even open up a book that we just want to go on It's Supernatural and listen to what Superman has to say. Just a thought. Next week, I'll finish this up. Did y'all get anything out of it? I mean, I kind of went on a little thing for a little bit. It's a little bit, of a little bit of a rant. But the point of it is we have this responsibility. And after being, like these guys know us, back from evangelism days and so this whole pastoring thing is a whole new ball of wax for us because we're trying to be so pastoral we're back in our evangelistic day we'd like get up your seat you lazy bum you know we just <laughs> but we're in a situation right now where i don't think necessarily that time is on our hand we always think that we have so much time, but there's a scripture that says, and that knowing the time, oh, we're good, and that knowing the time, it's high time that we awaken out of our sleep. For our salvation, Jesus is nearer than when we first believed. 
The night is at hand, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. He said, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The works of darkness is anything that will try to cover up the light. And that could be a whole myriad of things. But when we, when we, when we realize that souls or people, they've got to be a massive priority for us. I have a hard time thinking that we can just be a group of people that go to church on Sunday without having Monday through Saturday be your mission field. And it doesn't mean that people are going to come every week. And your only obligation is to extend an invitation. I do that every week. I work all the time. I'll see you Sunday. I'll see you Sunday. And then one guy goes, okay. And he goes, oh, wait, wait, you caught me. I thought I might have caught you, but I never saw you. But they'll come tomorrow. They'll say, hey, how was Sunday? Honestly, there's a few there. How was Sunday? How was the crowd? Are people coming back? I said, yeah, everybody's coming back but you. But I mean, I can put a, I can, I can you know, you're probably like, you get, a, you get a sword and you put a jelly donut on the end of it so I can stab you and make it t- taste good at the same time. Father, I thank you for today. God, I feel this incredible weight of responsibility and this incredible weight of a calling for this region. And God, that that calling has got to be shared. We can't carry that by ourselves. I pray that today, God, in the comfort of our seat, Lord God, that we would all receive a calling that goes beyond our confidence level, that goes beyond our courage level. And God, I declare it to everybody watching and everybody listening, be courageous, be strong, be very courageous. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord your God wants to give you as an inheritance, as a promise. I pray, God, that today that we would mm, repent In other words, we would change our mind from the way we used to think. God, that we would change the way we think by looking at others greater than we look at ourselves and looking at other people's needs greater than we look at ourselves. I pray that Impact Church is not just a church. God, let it be a soul-saving station. God, let this be a refuge for people that are looking for a home. God, let it be a refuge for the homeless. God, let it be a safe harbor for people whose boat seems to be sinking in the lake of life. I pray, Father, that when we see people whose whose life is like a boat and is full of water, that will not just be on the sideline looking and watching watching for for the boat to go underwater, but God, that we would do whatever we can to scoop the water out of that boat in their life. And God, that we would do whatever we can to keep them afloat. And God, as we keep them afloat, then we'll drag them to the safety of the ground, of the shore. Let souls be a massive priority for us today. In Jesus' name. If you guys need prayer for anything, our altars are going to be open. For those of you who are giving, we didn't mention that in the offering. There are buckets over there. We can't take offerings the way we used to, but you can actually put them in the black little buckets on your way out through that exit and that exit over there. But if you guys need prayer for whatever, then Cheryl and I will be up here. We'll still have to practice our social distancing. We'll say, in Jesus' name, (laughs) something like that. But uh, God bless you. Hope you got something out of that uh, today. And um, have a super-duper week. I know it's going to be a great week. And I'm going to be enjoying my gift from Laura later on this afternoon. Amen. Thank you. Amen.